Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is a program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you so much for tuning into my show this morning. I'm your host, Racker, and we are going to be continuing our chat about the police on the show today. The police have been in the news quite a lot lately, given the uh, cases of brutality against uh, Eric Gartner and uh, Michael Brown out in Ferguson, Missouri. And uh, there was also the case out in Fullerton where uh, the police beat a homeless man to death. And so we've been talking about some of the uh, problems with the police on the show. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the solutions that we might have uh, to bring about a more peaceful society. Uh, the police have already killed in January of 2015 alone 100 U.S. citizens. That's over three or just about three people per day. And so we really want to talk about different solutions that we can possibly implement to bring about a more peaceful society, one in which we do not have to worry about uh, enforcers of the government laws uh, killing people and hurting people and really injuring them. Uh, even the tasers that they use have been uh, causing people to have heart uh, problems and all sorts of things occur from the way that they've been enforcing the laws currently. So today on the show, I'd like to explore some alternative options that we might have to uh, policing as it currently exists in our society today. So in that regard, I'd like to read to you an article that I wrote, and it's exclusive to this particular radio station. You're not going to find it published anywhere else. And uh, it's about privatizing the police. Recently, we have been discussing the prominence of overwhelming police violence against the general public. American police have killed over 1,000 people in 2014, of whom many were unarmed and posed no actual danger to police. Many were killed in botched drug raids or carried out in callous disregard for the individual being pursued by the police. The police also tend to open fire on people's pets, killing what many people believe are their actual family members, their pets, their dogs. In stark comparison, Iceland just recently had its very first person ever killed by the police, and there were a lot of public apologies and sorrow felt by the people involved. Police here are barely even punished for using excessive force, leaving it understood that excessive force is perfectly acceptable and, quote, justified. The courts, which are also owned and provided by the same government that owns and provides the police, almost always side with the police officers in cases of violence, citing, quote, qualified immunity or, quote, legal immunity from the liability of the damages incurred to the general public. Moreover, police salaries are funded by taxation. This means that no matter the quality of the service provided, they will always get paid. In a normal market interaction, when a customer is dissatisfied or displeased with the services rendered to them, they can bring their money to a different service provider and therefore vote for a different company. To better illustrate this, let's use the example of a computer repair technician. Imagine if the technician you hired to fix your computer not only didn't fix your computer, but submersed it in a kitchen sink, leaving it completely useless and irreparable. Imagine then that the technician requires you to pay him and that there are no other companies that you could have potentially hired to fix your computer. If you refuse to pay this technician, he goes to the court systems and demands that you be locked in a jail cell. Not only that, but if you attempt to bring your broken computer to the court system and show that you were directly harmed by the technician, the court would side with the computer repair guy, saying that he had legal immunity for the damages he did to your computer. This would be absurd. We can see that not only would computers stop being repaired, but that the incentive would, in reality, be to provide the lowest quality possible and charge as much as possible. This is the economic incentive of monopoly. The same incentives are at work within government-provided police, since they are a monopolistic service provider that forces their clients to pay them via taxation. But what are the alternatives? A fully privatized police system would follow the model of any other company in the market economy. 
an individual or business who wanted to protect their property from violent criminals would have a chance to select from a number of different companies all competing to provide them with protection services. Some companies might charge higher prices, other companies might charge less. To convince potential clients, companies could provide data regarding their success rate of eliminating or reducing criminal activity in the areas they currently operate in. Companies that are better at protecting their clients and also at providing lower fees would gain more business and expand to cover more clients over a particular area. The incentives at work within this system would be first and foremost to reduce harm done to any clients or non-criminals. If they were to just randomly beat people up or worse, kill people, customers would be less comfortable purchasing from that company. Unsatisfied customers who were treated disrespectfully by that company's officers would likely migrate to companies less prone to violence or who engage in more rigorous hiring practices and oversight of their employees. Profitability would depend on customers being happy with the product rather than taxation being used to force people to pay for a product, whether they like it or not. Even treatment of criminals, including apprehension or aversion tactics, would influence the customer's decision to hire or not hire a protection agency. There are, of course, some concerns that people might have about this privatized police system. Would private security be so expensive that poor people would not be able to afford it? The fact that poor people currently can afford color televisions, cars, air conditioning, and other amenities in America, even with a high tax burden and regulations license requirements that make it difficult to start or even own a business, should attest to the fact that the market makes things more affordable for people. Something too expensive will not be bought. Entire companies would pop up to target those areas that are high crime and low income. They might work with the landlord of an apartment complex to provide security for the entire building that would be included in the tenant's rents. Because of the economic reality of the law of diminishing returns, it is beneficial to the company to provide security to an entire building rather than just one or two clients in that building. Therefore, a larger customer base in a consolidated area would lower the price for each customer, so tenants may band together and pool their resources to gain this protective benefit. The private police company could then station a few people in that area to cover the entire neighborhood, rather than having their officers so dispersed across a gigantic surface area for only a, clue, a few clients here or there. Moreover, currently the government police do cost money and a lot of money. If people had that money back in their own pockets, they would be able to better afford the cost of a private insurance company and property protection agency. Even still, some people may opt out of hiring a security company altogether. Perhaps they have the means to defend themselves. Perhaps they feel that their property is in no danger. Perhaps they are a pacifist and they do not believe in self-defense against criminal behavior. Whatever their reasoning is, it is their choice to make. If they can't afford security services and still feel in danger, maybe they can move to a lower rent or safer area, cut back on some expenses that are not necessary, train themselves to have better job opportunities and higher income, and etc. What if a private security company goes rogue and starts attacking its competitors or random individuals? The cost of aggressive violence is very high. All costs that a company accrues, provided that they do not have a government to offset those costs too, must be passed down to their customers. For a company to attack its competitors or amass armies to suppress a particular population, it would have to raise its prices to afford all of the secret armies, clandestine operations, black helicopters, things like that. This sets them at a severe disadvantage through their competition because they have to explain why their prices are so much higher. If they can explain to their customers why their product is that much more higher quality, then they could probably have the higher prices. But explaining to their customers that they want to march armies into foreign lands to seize their resources or into competitors' businesses in order to shut them down may not do that much to sway the customer's choice in their direction. In fact, because of the price system and the profit and loss of the market economy, businesses are much more transparent about their behavior and cannot engage in these clandestine and secret operations.
all of those operations have costs, which factor into the final price of that product. And those companies who do not engage in clandestine operations can offer much lower prices. What if these private security companies just arbitrarily make up rules that don't have anything to do with ethics or property rights? This question is actually very important to ask of the political system before we ask it of private companies. Currently, governments pass laws that are not in any way adherent to ethical or moral standards. Consider that everything that the Nazi regime did by kidnapping people, locking them in labor and concentration camps, and ultimately murdering them, was legal and was carried out by the letter of the law of the government. In other words, they simply passed arbitrary laws saying that concentration camps were legitimate and legal. In fact, currently there are a myriad ways that governments intervene violently in the economy which are themselves unethical by enforcing certain wages or prices, regulation, licensure, and other edicts. Forcing an employer to pay a certain wage or else face prison is unethical in terms of property rights and the freedom of association. Forcing a person to pay the police monopoly against their will is itself unethical and is contrary to property rights. But on the occasion that a private security company did enforce rules that people did not approve of, customers could just stop paying them. A vote of choosing to give money to a certain company in the market means that the customer approves of those services and practices of that company. By withdrawing that vote, customers have an immense power over companies in the market. So long as the market is not restricted to disallow new competitors who may have better ideas about how to protect person and property, we, the customers, have control over those companies and can change their behavior through our purchasing habits. Where we see the government most incapable to provide protection services, the voluntary market steps in to meet those demands. In Detroit, where the police are largely defunct, private companies are providing protection services to the people there. They do not commit violence, they focus on deterring criminal behavior instead of meeting it with counterforce, and they are paid for voluntarily by the people in the area who want these protection services. If we want to reduce or eliminate police violence against the general public at large, we must break up the police monopoly and remove the taxation from which they get their funding. Privatizing the police would go a long way towards bringing about both peace and security in our world. That article was by me, uh, Racker. I'm your host on the Austrian Circle today, and it was called Privatize the Police. The next article I would like to read uh, comes out of Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org, and it is in regards to the voluntary... Uh, actions of people in Ferguson in the response when the police kind of abandoned them. Uh, in Ferguson, the uh, police went to go defend the government buildings and just kind of left the looters and rioters to go and uh, go and target any local businesses in the area. And in fact, uh, proved that the police are not actually there to protect people and are incapable of protecting people. There was a lot of people who had their businesses burned down and uh, looted and really destroyed by the uh, random people who rioted. Um, and so that just really kind of proves that the police are not really capable of protecting person and property. And uh, moreover, we saw that the voluntary actions of people really came about and tried to protect people in the absence of the police. So this article is by Julian Adorni, and it's called Private Volunteers Step In Where Police Are a Wall." In Ferguson, Missouri, when police and National Guard failed to protect businesses from rioting protesters, a private organization called Oath Keepers stepped up to fill the gap. The presence of Oath Keepers keeping the peace where police officers failed helps answer a larger question. How necessary are the police? The heart of the state's justification has always been that it can provide essential services that the market cannot, chief among them security. While admitting that police abuses were problematic, Miguel Guadalupe of the Huffington Post asserted that, quote, One thing is certain, a strong body of law enforcement and one that is held in respect and prestige is critical to the stability of a society. As police forces fail some communities, private organizations are stepping up. 
Oath Keepers stationed volunteers on the rooftops of businesses in Ferguson, protecting them from looters. Local business owners said they felt safer knowing that the private entity was looking out for them. These organizations and others like them represent a test of state security and, by extension, of the state itself. Police find themselves unable to protect Detroit, Ferguson, and poor and minority communities. There are conflicting arguments for why this is. Critics may allege racism in police forces, while defenders will argue that police simply don't have the manpower to be everywhere. But in this case, the reason isn't important. When people living in these areas cannot rely on the police, they look for an alternative to fill that gap in protection. On a community and neighborhood level, they are looking for the framework of security that government claims only it can provide. If they seek our private frameworks and find themselves less well-served than they are currently by police, it will suggest, though not prove, that the minicus of the world are right to believe that government-provided security is important to society. On the other hand, if residents of these neighborhoods reach out to private organizations and find themselves safer and more secure than they used to be, it will further undermine the state's case for itself. The state monopoly on security will be seen to be no more necessary or wise than a state monopoly on food production. That article was by Julian Adorni. It's uh, posted on Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org. Private volunteers step in where police are AWOL. The last article I would like to read to you in the time that we have left is by William Norman Grigg, and it's called Call the Anti-Police, Ending the State's Security Monopoly. Quote, how would things be different, muses Dale Brown of the Detroit-based Threat Management Center, if police officers were given financial rewards and commendations for resolving dangerous situations peacefully rather than for using force in situations where it's neither justified nor effective? Brown's approach to public safety is, quote, precisely the opposite of what police are trained and expected to do, says the 44-year-old entrepreneur. The Threat Management Center, TMC, eschews the, quote, prosecutorial philosophy of applied violence and the officer safety uber ales mindset that characterized government law enforcement agencies. This is because this very successful private security company has an entirely different mission, the protection of persons and property rather than enforcing the will of the political class. Those contrasting approaches are displayed to great advantage in proto-dystopian Detroit. Quote, We've been hired by three of the most upscale neighborhoods in Detroit to provide 24-7 security services, Brown proudly informed me during a telephone interview. Quote, People who are well off are very willing to pay for Lamborghini quality security services, which means that our profit margin allows us to provide free services to people who are poor, threatened, and desperate for the kind of help the police won't provide. Quote, Unlike the police, we don't respond after a crime has been committed to conduct an investigation and some of the time at least arrest a suspect, Brown elaborates. Quote, our, pr- our approach is based on deterrence and prevention. Where prevention fails, our personnel are trained in a variety of skills, both psychological and physical, to dominate aggressors without killing them. Police typically define their role in terms of what they are permitted to do to people rather than what they are required to do for them. Brown's organization does exactly the reverse, even when dealing with suspected criminals. To illustrate, Brown refers to an incident from a security patrol in which he encountered a black teenager, quote, who was walking in a neighborhood at about 3 a.m., dressed in a black hooded sweatshirt, doing what is sometimes called the drift. It was pretty clear he was up to something. Rather than calling the police, who, given their typical four-hour response time, wouldn't have arrived soon enough to be of any help, as if helping were part of their job description, Brown took action that was both preventative and non-aggressive. Quote, I told him, there are criminals here who might rob you, so you'll get a free bodyguard service anytime you're in this neighborhood, Brown related to me. Quote, I also asked for his name and personal information for a, quote, good person file that would clear him with the cops next time he decided to go jogging in a black hoodie at three in the morning. He didn't have to give me that information, of course, but he told me what I needed to know, and we've never seen him there again. 
Brown and his associates take a similar approach to dealing with minor problems that usually result in police citations that clog court dockets and blight the lives of harmless people. Quote, when we see someone who is drunk or otherwise intoxicated, we offer to take their keys and call their families to get them home, he reports. Quote, this way we keep them safe from harm and, just as importantly, protect them from prosecution. Again, everything we do is the opposite of what police do. If you have a joint in your pocket, the cops will be all over you. But if you're facing actual danger, they're nowhere to be found and aren't required to help you even if they show up. That contrast is most visible in confrontations with potentially dangerous people. Brown's company receives referrals to provide security for people who face active threats, such as victims of domestic violence. One representative case involved a young mother whose daughter had been abducted by a violent, abusive father with a lengthy criminal history. The child was rescued and reunited with her mother without guns being drawn or anybody being hurt. For reasons of accountability and what the private sector calls quality assurance, Brown and his colleagues recorded that operation as they document nearly everything else they do. However, they weren't playing to the cameras. The same can't be said of the Detroit PD SWAT team that stormed the home of 7-year-old Ayanna Stanley Jones at midnight in May 2010 while filming the assault for a cable television program. Officer Joseph Weekly, who burst through the door carrying a ballistic shield and an MP5 submachine gun, shot and killed Ayana, who had been sleeping on the living room couch. By the time she was killed, the terrified little girl had already been burned by a flashbang grenade that had been hurled into the living room. The home was surrounded with toys and other indicators that children resided therein, and neighbors had pleaded with the police not to carry out the Blitzkrieg. The cops did arrest a suspect in the fatal shooting, but he resided in a different section of the same building. In any case, the suspect could have been taken into custody without a telegenic paramilitary assault, if the safety of those on the receiving end of police violence had been factored into the SWAT team's calculations. Owing in no small measure to public outrage, Weekly has been charged with involuntary manslaughter and careless d discharge of a weapon resulting in death. A jury deadlocked on the charges in July 2013. Weekly now faces a second trial that will produce a conviction only if the prosecution can overcome the presumption that the officer's use of deadly force was reasonable. This is a function of the entirely spurious and endlessly destructive doctrine of, quote, qualified immunity, which protects police officers from personal liability when their actions result in unjustified harm to the persons or property of innocent people. The rationale behind qualified immunity is the belief that absent such protection, competent and talented people wouldn't enlist as peace officers. In practice, however, qualified immunity merely emboldens incompetent and vicious police officers. Quote, police should be subject to exactly the same laws and liabilities that the rest of us face, contends Brown. If we don't have perfect reciprocity, then police should be held to a higher standard of accountability than the rest of the citizenry. If they commit criminal acts that result in injury or death, police should do double the time that a civilian would face because they're supposed to be professionals. As private sector professionals, Brown observes, quote, we have double accountability, first to our clients who pay us, and then to the criminal justice system and civil courts if we do something wrong. And because the police usually see us as competitors, they are very eager to come after us if we screw up. But in all the years we've been working, we've had no deaths or injuries, either to our clients or to our own people, no criminal charges, and no lawsuits. Not only do Brown and his associates operate without the benefit of qualified immunity, they are required to expose themselves to physical risk on behalf of their clients, something that police are trained to avoid. Quote, For police officers, going home at the end of the shift is the highest priority, Brown observes. For us, it can't be. When we're hired to protect a client, his home, his business, his family, we've made a choice to put the client's safety above our own and to make sure that he or she gets home safely at the end of the day. When people seek help from the police, Brown points out, they're inviting intervention by someone who has no enforceable duty to protect them, but will be rewarded for injuring them or needlessly complicating their lives. 
Some critics of TMC and other private security firms insist that their personnel cannot match the qualifications and experience of government-employed police officers. That objection wildly overestimates the professional standards that must be met in order for an individual to become a government-licensed purveyor of privileged violence. Quote, an individual can become a police officer in six months, Brown points out. Can you become a doctor or an EMT in six months? Is there any other profession in which employees can become qualified to make life and death decisions on behalf of other people after just a few months of training? By way of supplementing Brown's point, in Arkansas, an applicant can become a police officer in a day and work in that capacity for a year without professional certification of any kind. However, to become a licensed practicing cosmetologist, an applicant must pass a state board examination and complete 2,000 hours of specialized training. For an investment of 600 hours, an applicant can qualify to work as a manicurist or instructor. While Arkansas strictly regulates those who cut hair or paint nails in a private voluntary transaction, it imposes no training or license standards whatsoever on armed people who claim the authority to inflict lethal violence on others. This is not to concede that there is any way one human being can become legitimately qualified to commit aggressive violence against another. Quote, law enforcement attracts a certain personality type that is prone to narcissism and aggression, Brown asserts, speaking from decades of experience. People like that get weeded out from our program very early. We protect innocent people from predators, and we can't carry out the mission by hiring people who are predatory themselves. Our people receive extensive training in firearms and unarmed combat techniques, but they're also taught to look at all humans as members of the same family. The question we want them to ask themselves is, under what circumstance would you shoot or otherwise harm a member of your family? They're trained to apply that standard in all situations involving a potential use of force. People who can't think that way aren't going to fit in with our program. Brown emphatically agrees that the phenomenon called police militarization is a huge and growing menace, but insists that the core problem is not the military hardware or the other trappings of militarization, but of the system itself. Police agencies attract the wrong kind of people and then tell them, you're like God. They get to impose their will on others and use lethal force at their discretion. And when somebody who is really golden shows up, that is an ethical, conscientious person who wants to actually protect the public, they get redirected into a role that will minimize their influence for good by people who are worried about their own job security. Ideally, the best approach would be to abolish the current system and start over, Brown concludes. But the very least we should demand is that total equity and complete accountability, which would mean, as a starting point, doing away with this idea of qualified immunity. Police are citizens, and they should be governed by the same laws that apply to all citizens. No exceptions, no special protections. Several studies have shown that there are between three and four times as many private police officers, such as security guards, armored truck drivers, and private investigators, as sworn law enforcement officers in the United States. That fact demonstrates that the security market is completely unserved by government law enforcement agencies. This shouldn't be surprising, since, as, as I have observed before, police agencies serve the interests of those who plunder private property and thus can't be expected to protect it. Police personnel practice aggressive violence from the shelter of qualified immunity. The absence of such protection doesn't deter talented, motivated people such as Dale Brown and his associates, and others providing similar services in Houston, Oakland, and elsewhere, from seeking employment as private security officers who actually accept personal risk to protect property. Why not abolish qualified immunity for all security personnel? Critics of that proposal might protest that this would undermine the state's monopoly on the provision of security by requiring its employees to compete on equal terms with the private sector, which is precisely the point. So I hope that you enjoyed this. This has been another episode of the Austrian Circle. We will be back next week for another episode. Have a great week. Take care.